My name is Stuart Coleman. I'm the executive director of VI, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, and we are pleased to have you here tonight. We're doing town hall meetings across the state to educate people about the uh, issue of cesspools uh, and why uh, it's so important that we take care of this problem. Um, so welcome. And we can go to the next slide. All right, and we are very pleased. Um, last minute, uh, Council Member uh, Rebecca Villegas um, volunteered to do an opening only for us. And so we really appreciate you joining us and uh, appreciate you starting us off um, in the right headset and the right uh, mindset rather. I'll give it over to you, uh, Council Member Rebecca. I think you're on mute still, whoops. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Ah. Mm. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I look at this picture on the screen. This is my home, and this is the place that I have the honor, the privilege, and the responsibility of representing my current role on the Hawaii County Council. Mahalo, uh, Stuart, for um, providing me this privilege to um, share an Oli this evening. Uh, and what it asks for is the insight, the strength, and um, the determination to, to continue. It asks for the calling in for the insight, the strength, and the determination to continue this work that we do that um, is so important to um, our mo'opuna and our mo'opuna's mo'opuna and our mo'opuna's mo'opuna's mo'opuna. <laughs> so if you'll you just take a moment with me and take a breath and set the intention to call in that inspiration, that vision, that strength. Ho mai ka ike ike papa luha e. Ho mai ka ini ini papa luha e. Ho mai ka mana mana papa luha e. Ho mai. Mahalo. Thank you so much. That was beautiful and reminds us why we're here um, and the work we're doing. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can um, like to acknowledge my amazing team here at VI. Um, like I said, my name is Stuart Coleman, and I co-founded uh, VI uh, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations with uh, John Anner, um, who is on had to move back to the East Coast to take care of his parents. Um, and we've had Christina Comfort here, uh, probably the longest of this uh, crew, is our water quality specialist. Graham Lander is our operations manager. Shayla uh, Vicky is a local girl from the Big Island, from the Hilo side. Um, and she's our project coordinator. Gabby Zimmer is our curriculum developer and instructor. And so is Courtney Kerr, um, who are working uh, with Graham on the work for wor Workforce for Water program, which we'll tell you more about. And Courtney is located in Volcano. And then we have uh, Michelle Lee is our newest uh, addition to the team. So uh, a very talented team, um, and we're, we're very lucky to have them. You can go to the next slide. And uh, like I said, we're very lucky to have Council Member uh, Rebecca Villegas here because she had quite a day, um, and as did Representative Nicole Lowen. Um, and we're so glad that you could make it, um, Representative Lowen. And we'll probably start with uh, asking you to say a few words 
Um, but I wanted to mention that Senator um, Drew Kanuha couldn't make it. He had a, um, a meeting at the last minute. Um, it was called a leadership meeting of the Senate. Um, but we're also very pleased for our expert panel later on. We have uh, Dr. Steve Colbert. We have Dr. Tracy Wiegner uh, and Ramsey Mansoor that are joining us along with our, our vice staff. And at this point, I'll turn it over to um, Representative Lowen to say a few words. Hi, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, can you see me? Because I think it said something about the video being hidden. I wasn't sure. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I didn't need to be spotlighted. I just wasn't sure if it was uh, blocked. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll keep it brief so we can get to our uh, panelists. Um, but I want to thank Stuart and the VIA team in, in particular for doing this town hall. We've been um, talking about doing it for a while, as um, probably many people on this uh uh, you know, webinar are aware, and maybe a few aren't, um, there's a big issue with cesspools in the state of Hawaii on the Big Island in particular, and then in, um, you know, West Hawaii also has its, its share of cesspools. So I imagine some people here own homes or, you know, areas with cesspools and are worried about how they're going to convert. Um, we, um, you know, I worked with Stuart and some of the others who are on the panel for many years as a member of the Cesspool Conversion Working Group. And I also chair the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, so this is an issue I've spent a lot of time on, um, including this session when we had a lot of bills under consideration. At the end of the day, we actually did not pass any bills this year, but we had a lot of really, um, I think, productive conversations and things that we can come back to next year and um, you know other work that can happen um, kind of offline and, and without necessarily needing bills. Um, sorry, I'm a, a little bit uh, just talking off the cuff. I literally just got off an airplane and walked into my house and got on the Zoom call. So I'm glad I made it in time. Um, and I will go ahead and just uh, wrap it up. And I think I'll be um, around to also be able to answer questions if any questions come up that pertain to the work that, that I do that other panelists aren't able to address. So again, thank you so much, Stuart and the VI team and everybody uh, else for showing up tonight and everybody on the panel. Thank you. You're a hero for all the work that you've done and uh, being here tonight after the day that you had. Um, and we'll ask uh, just, uh, Rebecca Villegas to say a few words as well, and then we'll dive into the um, slideshow. Um, there we go. Uh, Aloha. First, I want to say thank you, Nicole, for being here. I can only imagine the stress and the scramble uh, with all those planes, but I want to personally and professionally thank you for your continued vigilance and endurance in navigating the state legislature with such grace and calm and ease, um, fighting uh, a fight that is, you know, uh, one step at a time. Um, here on the Big Island, uh, you know, I sit in a home built in 1974 that has a cesspool. And I couldn't even tell you, um, it, there is no capacity to put in a septic system with a leach field because of the way that the land uh, uh, is created here and on such a slope and um, sewer is so far away. So we have about 49,000, I believe, of the cesspools in the state here on the Big Island. I have spent more time in office talking about wastewater and poop um, than probably any other issue. Um, besides homelessness and affordable housing now. Um, so our infrastructure and where we're at, not only as, you know, District 7 that I represent as an island and as a state as a whole, we're at capacity until we handle and we mitigate the issues we're facing because they directly affect our health and safety and that of our grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. So. It's unfortunate that we've put off um, dealing with our shit, literally, for this long. But now is the time. And the science and the technology and the will and the political will and the leadership from these next generations is there. So I thank each and every one of you for your continued vigilance 
for your tenacity and for your perseverance. And I'm just grateful to be a part of the conversation and uh, be here to learn and grow alongside every one of you. So hand in hand, side by side, let's get those luas off the beach <laughs> as the photo behind. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo, thank you. All right, and I'll pass it to Graham. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the kind words. My name is Graham Lander. I'm the operations manager, as uh, Stuart uh, introduced me before. Uh, before we start the presentation tonight, I just thought uh, it might be useful if I give you guys a quick uh, overview of our organization. So Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, also known as VI, is a 501c3 environmental nonprofit based out of Honolulu. Uh, we're one of the only uh, nonprofits in Hawaii solely focused on the CESPO issue. Uh, our mission is to protect water quality, reduce uh, sewage pollution, and restore healthy watersheds by providing innovative, affordable, and eco-friendly solutions to waste and wastewater management for all people. And our vision uh, is to help Hawaii homeowners and communities manage uh, this process of upgrading cesspools and failing septic systems to new systems that are affordable, efficient, and better for the environment. Um, so as you see uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, it's, these are our guiding principles or our uh, guiding pillars. Uh, VI, uh, we, we do quite a lot of outreach. Um, we interact with uh, not only individual homeowners, but community groups as well to learn uh, their needs and uh, share the environmental and health threats associated with cesspools and sewage. So we host events similar to this uh, one tonight, uh, doing town halls. We also do public uh, presentations to smaller groups, workshops, and also host an annual convening. Uh, another uh, large pillar of our organization is the innovative technology and pilot pro uh, project side of it. Uh, which, which essentially means that we, uh, we work with uh, wastewater organizations, uh, typically on the mainland, uh, to introduce new technology to Hawaii, to introduce more competition to the market, um, to make it more affordable, um, and bring in uh, more uh, eco-friendly solutions to homeowners to utilize um, and to mitigate the waste. Um, building off this, uh, we do a lot of pilot projects uh, and demonstration sites uh, using this technology, and we work alongside the Department of Health to uh, get these technologies approved so they can be adopted uh, by any homeowner uh, that, that would like it. Um, we also do a lot of uh, policy and advocacy work. Um, as, as Stuart alluded um, before, we've worked alongside uh, Representative uh, Nicole Lowen, uh, in the past, um, and we've also worked with other legislators to, to update um, policies and to assist um, just uh, homeowners in general with um, the conversion process. Um, and our last pillar is the financial resources. Uh, we're continuously looking for fun, uh, funding resources for homeowners to assist with the conversion costs um, for both of these systems as well. So uh, we would work alongside the EPA, uh, uh, DOH, um, USDA, and other private foundations to um, to bring uh, funding opportunities uh, for for these homeowners. Next slide, please. Perfect. So for tonight, um, our agenda is uh, we're going to be covering the, uh, the the following topics: the impacts of cesspools and uh, on the environment and the public health um, in Hawaii. Uh, the various laws and regulations related to cesspool conversions and the timeline for implementation, uh, the Department of Health uh, classification uh, for priority zones um, on Hawaii Island, um, and in particular Kona, uh, the conversion technologies uh, that are available to homeowners, um, some of the financial resources that homeowners could take, on, uh, take advantage of to assist with the conversion costs, um, and Vi will also be talking about the workforce development program uh, that we recently were approved for, which is going to be um, relating to wastewater um, career paths. And then we'll go into a Q&A session uh, with the panel and the legislators um, to discuss uh, these issues if you have, um, have further questions. And if you have further questions uh, just throughout the presentation and you wanna bring them up, feel free to utilize the chat um, feature and our staff will do, um, do our best to assist you and to answer any inquiries that you might have. 
All right, next slide, thank you. So just a, a quick poll uh, pre-meeting. Um, if you wouldn't Thanks. mind, sorry, go ahead, Gabby. Take no, it away. that's all right. Thank you. Um, so we would like to take a brief poll to help us better understand your needs. All questions will be multiple choice. So please select the answer that best represents you. The first two questions will be uh, multiple choice. What are you looking forward to learning about the most from the presentation? And you'll see a list of different topics, actually exactly what we just saw on the agenda. The second question is, are you aware of any relevant government mandates related to cesspools? And that's just a simple yes or no question. Then we'll have two questions that are really kind of a ranking based on how you feel. They will be multiple choice and it'll be a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. The, so you can choose strongly disagree, disagree, neither disagree nor agree, agree and strongly agree. The first question you'll pick for is, I am familiar with the environmental and human health issues associated with cesspools. And the second question you'll rank strongly disagree to strongly agree is, it is, it is important to address wastewater issues in my community. So I will launch the poll right now. Please let us know if you have any um, issues or setbacks at all in the chat. Before I launch the poll, please remember to scroll down to see all of the questions. And if you're on a phone, an Android, iPhone, any tablet or any other device that is not a computer or a laptop, you may need to rotate your screen so that it's horizontal or the long way. Um, and if you have any questions again, please let us know in the chat and remember to return to the poll by selecting the more button. So here you can see all of the four questions. And we'll take a moment to let you all select your answers. I mean, encourage you to jump in and um, answer these questions because it just gives us a sense of um, you know, the amount of information out there, what we need to focus on and uh, gauge, you know, kind of the um, public's uh, interest and concerns um, and questions. So we'd like to get as many people as we can. I feel like I'm, we're at a telethon. We're at <laughs> seven and we just need to hit at least 50. So come on, people, <laughs> dial in. <laughs> Great, we'll give it just uh, about a half minute more. See if we can get, this is our, one of our largest town halls that we've hosted so far. We have uh, 85 participants. Um, so we'd love to see if we can get at least uh, 60 people uh, responding. Um, I hit submit and it seems frozen. Sue said, submit not working. Um, Interesting. We got about six. So if if submit is not working, that means that you have not answered all of the required questions. So please just go back to make sure that each answer has been selected. If there is no audio, I would recommend going down to the bottom, tapping the dot 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 and adding to more, and then you should be able to connect to audio. Okay, we're at about at 83%. Perfect. Thank you all for your feedback. All right, so here are all our results. We will share this with you um, as well as the slides um, after the presentation. Um, uh, and we will send the video as well, the recording. All right, Graham, we'll give it back to you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview of uh, the, the two different systems that we're uh, talking about in particular here tonight. 
Um, so as you can see, we have both the cesspools and uh, septic tanks. Um, so uh, both of these systems are located um, on site um, on your residence, um, if, you, if you have one of these. Um, everything uh, essentially that goes uh, down the drain from every drop um, in your shower to every flush of the toilet uh, flows in through uh, both of the in inlet pipes that you see in the diagram there. Uh, in terms of the treatment, uh, cesspools are pretty much as basic as it gets. They're typically just a hole in the ground uh, lined with uh, stone or cement. And the cesspool doesn't have the ability to filter waste, which means that sewage will eventually contaminate um, the surrounding soil um, and leachate as well. Uh, this is why cesspools are generally considered outdated and why Hawaii is looking to convert uh, these particular systems. In, con on, in contrast, uh, the septic systems on the right, uh, these are typically watertight containers that hold wastewater and allow um, it to separate into layers with the solid sludges sinking to the bottom and the liquids rising to the top. Uh, the liquid layer then flows out of the tank um, either uh, to a drain field or it can get pumped out. Um, but the septic tanks are designed to treat wastewater and reduce the risk of pollution, but they are also uh, can be a source of environmental contamination if they're not maintained properly or if they break down. Um, and for my next slide, I'm, I'm going to just play a short video which goes into further detail about how cesspools work and how they impact uh, both the environment and public health. Cesspool construction was recently banned in Hawaii, but what is a cesspool and what problems do they cause? A cesspool is basically a covered hole in the ground. It is sometimes lined with brick or concrete. Open joints in the lining allow liquid and solid waste to seep through. Cesspools are designed to dispose of waste, but not to treat it. If you have a cesspool, when you flush your toilet, use your kitchen sink, take a shower, or do laundry, untreated wastewater and gray water is directed into this hole underground. Human waste moves away from the cesspool through Hawaii's porous lava rock. Eventually, it reaches the water underground and contaminates it with dangerous pathogens and household chemicals. Because we live on islands, everything is interconnected. We rely on underground aquifers Water from these aquifers is also connected to the ocean through a process called submarine groundwater discharge. When pollution from cesspools travels in water underground, it impairs our drinking water sources and negatively impacts our ocean ecosystems. Human waste contains viruses and bacteria that can make us sick if we consume water contaminated with them. Our waste naturally contains nutrients like nitrogen that can wreak havoc on coral reefs by causing algal blooms. The medications we take and personal care products we use can also negatively impact Hawaii's plants and animals. Hawaii has over 83,000 cesspools that contribute an estimated 52 million gallons of raw sewage into our environment every day. Because of these impacts, cesspools are required to be replaced with more effective forms of wastewater treatment by 2050 to continue to protect our health, that of our loved ones, and of our environment. Cesspools need to be upgraded as soon as possible. For more information on cesspools in your neighborhood, visit hawaiicesspooltool.org. This video was produced by the Hawaii Department of Health, University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, and the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Hawaii. Alrighty, so I hope that video was educational for you all tonight. Um, we're gonna move forward here, and I now would like to continue with background information of Hawaii's cesspool issue, and would like to cover some of the legislation that has been put into place over the years. So here on this slide is a timeline from 2016 to present that shows the legislation and mandates that have been passed since. In 2016, Act 120 was passed, which banned the construction of new cesspools in Hawaii and offered a $10,000 tax break to homeowners to upgrade their system. A year later, in 2017, Act 125 was passed, which mandated Hawaii to upgrade all cesspools by 2050. 
and also required Hawaii Department of Health to complete a priority upgrade area report. Later in 2018, Act 132 was signed and created the CESPO Conversion Working Group. This group convened for four years, which resulted in recommendations to the legislature and has sunset in 2022. Also in 2022, three bills relating to cesspools were passed. These bills included HB 2195, HB 2088, and HB 1806. Currently, as the legislative session here in Hawaii is wrapping up, HB 1396 was the only surviving cesspool bill up until last week Friday, where it was killed in conference committee. So I would now just like to provide you folks with some information about the bills that were passed last year in 2022. So HB 2195 provided grants to, to low and moderate income homeowners of up to $20,000 to help with the cost of cesspool conversion. This program officially launched the beginning of this year through Hawaii's Department of Health. HB 1806 allowed new types of technologies to be prevented for cesspool replacement here in Hawaii um, beyond just regular septic systems and aerobic treatment units. Last week, HB 2088 allowed commercial property owners to finance qualifying improvements through property assessment. So taking a look at this year's legislative session, which came after the conclusion of the cesspool conversion working group, there were many cesspool bills introduced. HB 1396 made it near the finish, but an, made it near the finish line and included numerous of the top recommendations from the cesspool conversion working group. I have provided here the contents of HB 1396, but one of the most important recommendations included in this bill was the creation of a new cesspool section within Department of Health, Department of Health to specifically help with cesspool conversions here in Hawaii. For the next legislative session, we will be working alongside many others to bring some of these recommendations and bills back to the legislature and hopefully help get them passed. So now I'm moving on into cesspool conversion priority areas. The Hawaii Department of Health partnered with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant and the University of Hawaii Water Resources and Research Center to create a prioritization tool, which highlighted different areas as priority for cesspool conversion. This tool utilized 15 factors, but did not encompass water quality studies due to the lack of a comprehensive study for the entire state. As a result, there are three different levels of priority areas. As defined by the Department of Health, priority one areas have the greatest contamination hazard, priority two areas have a significant contamination area hazard, and priority three areas have a pronounced contamination hazard. So first, I would just like to take a look at Hawaii Island as a whole. Um, Hawaii Island has approximately 49,000 cesspools. That is about 60% of all cesspools present here in the state of Hawaii. Um, these 49,000 cesspools discharge approximately 30.4 million gallons of effluent per day. If we take a, take a look at the map here, Hawaii Island has two priority one areas, that being Kwaihai Waikoloa and Kailua Kona. It also has three priority two areas, one on the east side, Hilo, and two on the west side, Kealakehe and Keoho. And all other regions on Hawaii Island is categorized as a priority level three. So if we zoom in and take a closer look at the first priority one area, Kwaihai Waikoloa, um, this region has approximately 2,000 cesspools that discharge 1.2 million gallons of effluent per day. So if you take a look at this map, these dots here indicate cesspools. And as you can see, there are cesspools along the coastline, but there are also some further inland. So these cesspools and the effluent discharge into nearby waters affect water quality, public health, as well as the health of our coastal ecosystems. We have also provided on this slide the names of your local representative in case you folks are unaware. Taking a look at another priority one area, that being Kailua Kona, this region has approximately 3,000 cesspools that discharges 1.9 million gallons of effluent per day. So if you take a look at the map, you can see that the density of cesspools here is very much higher, and it also is concentrated in certain regions. Um, there are cesspools along the coastline, in this Midland area, and further up Mocha. And then last but not least, priority area two, Kealakehe. This region has about 530 cesspools that discharges about 300,000 gallons of effluent per day. 
Um, as you can see, those cesspools are concentrated further in Mocha because I believe the KLKH treatment plant and the sewer mains are down here. On this slide here, we have provided you folks with representative contact information, your state representatives, your state senators, as well as your city council members by the priority areas I previously discussed. Um, this contact information is also made available on the Capitol website, capital.hawaii.gov, but for easier access, we have provided it here for tonight. Feel free to screenshot this slide or just jot down your local representatives. Alrighty, so to switch gears a little bit, um, we're going to talk about some water quality in the Kailua Kona area. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you folks tonight, Dr. Stephen Colbert and Dr. Tracy Wigner, who are professors at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, who do a lot of work in the water quality realm. Tonight, they will be sharing some water quality information based off of their work in Kailua Kona. So I'll hand it over to you folks now. All right, thank you. Hi there, my name is Steve Colbert and uh, Tracy, if you wanna jump in at any time, feel free. Uh, mahalo for having us here today. Uh, we've been working on the cesspool issue since about 2013, uh, beginning up in the Puoko area uh, and then working some in the Hilo area. And now we've just recently started a project in the Kailua Kona area that I'll present a little bit about near the end of this. Um, so. Oh, next slide. <laughs> to bring the issue home for Kailua Kona, um, it has the second highest density of cesspools on Hawaii Island. Um, the, the Keao Hilo area is number one, but the uh, Kailua Bay area is number two. And if you look at how much um, potential future development there is in the area, uh, that number is just gonna grow uh, moving forward. Now we see these impacts of cesspools and sewage pollution into our coastal ocean uh, coming in from uh, in, in indicators that we see along the shoreline. So for example, uh, there's been this persistent loss of coral that's been recorded, 6% uh, loss of coral in Kailua Bay. Uh, and then there's also this high abundance of coral diseases. And there's been a few other studies that have looked at in, in areas where there's more wastewater getting into the coastal ocean, there tends to be more of these coral diseases. That's the photo in the middle there, that white blob. It looks like a tumor growing on the coral. Uh, it's a growth anomaly, and those are the most common um, coral disease that we find in Kailua Bay. And then there's been these uh, several occurrences where there have been extremely high uh, fecal indicator bacteria concentrations, um, 10 times the state standard back in 2020. And around the same times, we had these uh, algae blooms. And it wasn't just in 2020, there's been these other times in the past where there have been these algae blooms. You can see a picture of that from uh, our collaborators from VI that took this uh, algae bloom picture. The water off of Kailua Kona is supposed to be this clear, beautiful um, blue. And so when we get these algae blooms, we know that there's something wrong. There's something going on with our system. Next slide. So to put this into a big picture, um, the statewide, I was part of the statewide study that provided some of the data um, to the legislature to help them identify these priority areas. And this was some of the supporting evidence for that. Uh, Shayla was actually one, the one who went out and collected these water quality samples for us uh, and, or, and algae samples that we're looking at. So uh, one of the places where we looked was at Holuoloa. And at Holuoloa, shown up here on the top right is where we have, um, the nitrogen isotopes in the algae. And higher values are telling us an, as an indicator of more pollution in the water. Uh, the highest site was at Puoko um, up in South Kohala, but Holuoloa was the second highest values, had the second highest indication of sewage pollution uh, for Hawaii Island. <clears throat> and then, and you can see the data where we were looking at, where we were sampling, you can see the, the triangles in the bottom figure the triangles along the shoreline, and all those purple dots, Mauka, are the location of cesspools in this area. Uh, and so we're seeing that, that source of, of, of sewage showing up at the shoreline. 
when it's when this is integrated into the statewide picture, it turns out that uh, Holuoloa ranked 12th highest out of 33 sites uh, as a sewage impacted shoreline. And this was a, this analysis was part of the reason why it ended up being a priority one site. Next slide, please. So we have a current project going on that we started last summer. Uh, we have a st graduate student, uh, Ihilani, who's been collecting water samples for us at 12 sites along the Kailua um, coastline. So we have five sites up in Kailua Bay and then down to three sites uh, near uh, Holuoloa and then three more sites at uh, Kahalu'u Bay and then one more site at Keaho. And we chose these sites based on the presence of groundwater coming out. So where we have that direct connection to the um, pollution coming from Mauka. And then also due to their cultural importance or just where people are going in the water. Uh, and we sample these every month and we analyze them for a whole suite of indicators for sewage, for the presence of sewage, including nutrients in the water, the nitrogen isotopes like the other study did, um, two different fecal indicator bacteria, and we've also been sampling for Staphylococcus or aureus um, and MRSA. Uh, with this project, what we're hoping we're doing is identifying these locations where sewage is a is more likely coming out at the shoreline. And there's a second part of this project where we're also doing some modeling to look at what sewage infrastructure there is in the area and how sea level rise is going to impact that sewage infrastructure. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of results, some numbers. Uh, we don't have all of our data in yet, but we do have the Enterococcus data. Enterococcus is a fecal indicator bacteria that can be used as an indicator of, um, of sewage pollution. So when we see it high, it's suggesting that there could be a problem with sewage coming into those areas. Um, there were six sites that had uh, single sample values that were greater than 140, just to put that in, the 140 is kind of like a single sample. When that happens, they typically go out and um, uh, uh, post the beach for it being uh, polluted and needing more attention. Uh, several of these sites have had, or these same six sites have had at least two to five samples that had greater than 35 um, NPNs at it. And this number is important because three, Anything above that number is an indicator that a person that like 3.5% of people that go swimming in that water will contract uh, gastrointestinal issues. Um, so it can, that can make you sick. And so it's a, an EPA standard that's been set. Mm -hmm. So where we've seen this uh, was at the, the Hulihe'e beach, right, right up there by the Kona Pier um, in downtown Kailua. Um, that is one of the places that we've seen a lot um, near the Royal Kona Hotel as well. And then at two of these sites here at Holuoloa, we've seen these high values, which was consistent with the statewide report. And then two more sites down at Kahalu, um, where we've been sampling. So uh, we've also done a little bit of Staphylococcus work and we've seen it at several of the sites, which is concerning. Uh, but we're looking forward to getting more data. We just started that work a, a couple months ago. So we're looking forward to getting more data for that. Our next sampling is coming up in two weeks. If you see Ihilani out there sampling, uh, feel free to say hi. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna be talking about some of the technologies and uh, we um, will be looking at individual wastewater systems as well as decentralized systems. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, right now, individually for individual wastewater systems, there are, you know, um, septic system, which requires a lot of space and nutrients still leach out to pollute the water resources. And they, you know, recent studies have shown and really confirmed that those nutrients are very destructive for coral reefs and local ecosystems. 
There are also composting toilets, but uh, DOH doesn't like these models just because there's handling of raw waste. Um, and we, you know, they don't think it's a, a large scale uh, model that'll be a solution for most people, especially because we still have to take care of the gray water and, and other um, what's considered black water from the, the sink, kitchen sink as well. And so we're looking at other models, if we can go to the next slide, um, that uh, other technologies rather that can just provide, we're trying to provide as many alternatives as possible for homeowners. Um, and this was one of our first um, uh, technologies that we embraced was the Cinderella incineration toilet. This is waterless um, and it comes from Norway. And we introduced these to Hawaii and the Western United States and uh, they've been extremely successful. There are uh, more than 50 units across Hawaii. Um, they incinerate the waste to a pathogen-free odorless ash. Um, and there are two versions, electric for use in homes and then propane for um, off the grid outhouses. And we've got those at a number of farms and uh, remote uh, government comfort stations. Um, and this is certified by the National Sanitation Foundation. So we have those ac across Hawaii and a number on the Big Island as well. And next, um, we have uh, three different models um, that we uh, you know, think are much better than septic because they do that denitrification. Um, and, and that's you know, really important, um, not only for environmental health, but for human health. And so on the left, we have a system that we're about to install next week, um, a geotextile sand filter system from Elgin. Um, and that has a nitrifying sand layer and a denitrifying layer for wood chips and such. And um, this is great because it's passive. And um, another one we have that we got the first two, the Elgin model, the layer cake and the constructed wetlands and bio garden, bioreactor garden model. Um, that Rich Reef put together. We got these approved from the Department of Health um, and are starting to put those in the ground. And both of them have very uh, successful um, denitrification rates that are higher than the National Sanita Sanitation Foundation standard, um, that's NSF 245, um, and have done much better. Now, the one that's existed for a while are aerobic treatment units, and we partnered with a group um, called Fuji Clean. Um, that these are the smallest of the ATUs and use the, the least electricity. Um, but this is where the other two are passive. This does require electricity and a pump um, to recirculate that um, waste. And so if you are near the coast um, or near a well, a drinking water well, then the DOH will probably um, uh, mandate that you put in uh, one of these systems. And then this is an installation that we did in the big on the Big Island um, last year. Uh, this is uh, an Elgin geotextile sand filter system. We did this in Hawaii Paradise Park, um, and uh, they replaced an existing cesspool. And we um, Elgin is a veteran-owned uh, company, um, and they did this for free, donated it um, for a veteran, which was uh, incredibly generous of them. Um, and so we can tell you more about these uh, if you're curious offline. And the next slide we have, uh, this was the first installation of a Cinderella toilet um, in Hawaii at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology um, on Mokuoloe. And, uh, and like I said, now there are about 50 of them across the state. And so, you know, what we're looking for when we do these is you know higher rates of nitrogen removal, um, and so we uh, did a test, a pilot test with Ridge to Reefs and the Department of Health, working with the University of Hawaii um, to get this proved. And like we said, the NSF 245 standard is 50% removal. This got as high as 87%, which is amazing. 80% um, over 80% phosphorus removal, and then. Uh, total suspended solids, 96%. So this is amazing. And there was also a volume reduction. So we're asking DOH for a smaller leach field for those houses that use this, 
that might not have enough space for a full uh, leach field. And it's passive, so there are no um, utility costs that go along with that. And moving forward, we're going to talk now about kind of uh, community scale wastewater systems. And these are sometimes reserved referred to as cluster or decentralized systems or package plant. And this is kind of the middle ground between centralized sewer and individual wastewater systems. Um, and as you know, um, Christine McTavish mentioned in the chat, um, this is you know ideal for uh, places that are remote that are far away from like where Rebecca Viegos lives and there's not any sewer anywhere along nearby, and they probably never will be. It's just too expensive. Um, but this, you can connect a group of homes in a cluster and either funnel that to the nearest system, um, sewer system, that is, or have its own treatment system as part of it. And so a couple of the companies we're working with um, are, the, the first on the next one is Biomass Controls, and this was a, a company, this picture was taken at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's their reinvented toilet expo. And I know you guys are jealous that you weren't there. Um, sounds like an exciting conference, but um, this is really, really cutting edge um, stuff that we are very excited um, and hopeful to bring to Hawaii because right now, basically all of the sludge that's produced in sewer system, wastewater treatment plants across Hawaii is trucked to landfills. So you can imagine the greenhouse gases that are emitted, the methane just from the waste itself, but then also the trucking cost. And then you take it to a landfill, it's still very much liquid, um, even though it's sludge, you can't get rid of all the liquid. And this can leach into leach into you know the, the um, landfills and into the drinking water into the groundwater um, beneath. And so what this system does is it uses uh, a technique called py pyrolysis and using um, medium heat and low oxygen over time, it can turn all that waste into like a soil amendment. And these can be shipped in, in containers um, anywhere. And we could put it in, you know, at, at local wastewater treatment plants and avoid all those trucking costs and all the methane gases. Um, and you can add ag waste from like parks and such. And so if you look, it produces something called biochar. Um, there, there are a, a couple of plants across Hawaii that can produce sludge, but farmers um, and golf courses don't want this because it's still got a lot of contaminants of emerging concern. It smells bad. Um, it's got pharmaceuticals in it. And so, you know, most farmers are like, no, we, we don't want this. We don't want it contaminating our crops. The great thing about biochar is it's odorless. It's, you know, almost a hundred percent, um, you know, contaminant free in terms of, um, getting rid of the, any of the pathogens. And then it gets rid of over 98% of contaminants of emerging concern as well, including PFOS and PFAS, which the EPA is really coming down on now. Um, and it captures all of the gas. It can use that gas to help run it. So a lot of these can be off the grid and don't require much power. Unlike um, most sewage treatment plants, it uses a lot of power and still produces methane gas. So once you produce the biochar, which is in his hand, that can be actually used as a soil amendment and as a carbon sink. Um, so this is one of the like the probably leading edge of research in waste and, and wastewater technology. And um, there are pilot projects, you know, they're developing around the world because we this alone could help us make significant progress towards becoming carbon neutral um, and fulfilling our, our goals as a state. Um, to reduce our greenhouse gases. So that's super exciting. Um, and we hope to have a project. Uh, Tapani Vuari, who's the head of the Maui Ocean Center, is on the call tonight. And we're hoping to get the first unit in Malaya um, on Maui, which is um, really a, a cool project. And then along with taking care of the sludge, conveyance is very important. So 
how do you get the waste in those houses that are very remote to either a sewer line that might be miles away or to a package treatment plant? Um, well, we are working with a model that we call um, Prelos, which is pressurized liquid only sewer. And this is where you use just PVC piping, small diameter. Um, it's easily installed right beneath the ground. And instead of having to put it in a whole leach field, a septic tank and leach field, the leach field is often the most expensive part of individual wastewater um, systems. And so here you just need to put in a smaller tank. It does some treatment in there, but what it does, if, if you look at it in the diagram, most of the layer, and it doesn't really show it quite accurately, is like 80% is just liquids. And so they just pump from that zone to a, 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 you know, a, a slightly larger pipe, which is only like one and three quarters inches in diameter, and only using a half horsepower motor, which is easily replaced and doesn't need a specialist, you can pump this for miles and miles um, to either a treatment plant um, or to a sewer line if there's capacity in the local wastewater treatment plant. So, you know, and especially on the Big Island where we have so many um, areas with homes that are either tightly put together or there's just, um, not enough room for a leach field and certainly enough, not enough soil. And so where you have volcanic uh, rock or um, cinder neath the soil, this takes it away from the coast and, and gets it pumping towards treatment where you can reuse the water. So that's one of the most important things is that, especially along the Kona coast, we can reuse this water for landscaping and irrigation. Um, so this is something that we're, really looking for a community to install one of our first pilot systems. This company has grown 100% over the pandemic, just as counties across the country are realizing this is a much, much, much more efficient and affordable model. Um, and so one of their biggest customers across the country um, are counties um, that are saying, okay, we're gonna save a lot of money and it's much less disruptive than um, doing sewer line, gravity sewer lines, where you have to sometimes on their roads that are only two ways, you sometimes have to, there are only two lanes rather, um, the road will be under construction for up to six months at a time. So this avoids all that. You can just trench it right on the side of the road. All right, next side, there we go. Um, and now we can talk about uh, financial assistance. Perfect, I'll take over now. Thank you, Graham. Since uh, cesspools have a negative impact, um, the USDA has recognized this as an issue and uh, offers uh, financial assistance as a result through both the grants and uh, loans uh, to assist with conversions. Uh, one of which is the Water and Waste Disposal Loan um, and Grant Program, which supports the development um, of uh, water and waste uh, disposal systems in rural areas. This program, <coughs> sorry, this program can provide funding um, for planning, construction, and improvement to the cesspool conversion projects. Typically, the funding uh, comes from uh, in the form of loans. Uh, low interest loans, sorry, uh, they typically have rates of between uh, one to two and a half percent per annum. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, finding out a little bit more about this funding option, you can uh, visit this link that's in the slide here, um, or we can, uh, Vi can actually help you uh, with the application process and we can let you know if you're eligible um, and with, whether or not you meet the, the criteria. Um, please note, uh, just in the slide as well, we can see in the image that <coughs> that Hilo is is ineligible for uh, for these loans. Um, so if you're sharing this with other individuals, that um, that particular location is is out of the question. Next slide, please. <coughs> As Shaler uh, mentioned earlier, we're very excited. Um, the Department of Health uh, is, has enacted uh, one of the, the legislations which was passed in 2022 um, and has enacted uh, the cesspool pilot uh, grant program, uh, which is essentially 
is funding for low to medium uh, moderate uh, income property owners uh, to assist with converting, upgrading and connecting their cesspools um, to wastewater uh, management systems. So under this program, uh, eligible recipients are able to receive up to $20,000 in reimbursements for their conversions or connection costs to the sewer. Um, I think that the total, I believe that the total amount for this uh, this grant program as well it was allocated at uh, five million dollars. So it's a first come uh, first serve basis. So uh, it started, uh, I believe, back in March. Um, and so I believe that the, the funding for it could could go uh, particularly quick, um, depending on on the interest. So in order to be eligible, uh, for this grant, applicants <clears throat> must either be a property owner or uh, be a Department of uh, Hawaiian Homelands uh, lessee, um, and they, their your your property must be located uh, either in a prop, uh, priority level one zone or a priority priority level two zone, <clears throat> which was what uh, Shayla shared with you um, previously. And Kona is considered a priority one zone. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, the household income requirements um, mean that uh, it has, it's servicing uh, low to moderate income uh, property owners. So these are some of the brackets that are uh, provided on the Department of Health uh, website. I also uh, added the link in here um, for this particular slide because the Department of Health has all of the eligibility requirements uh, for, this, uh, for this grant program, but it's one of the most uh, promising uh, funding options that you probably have as a homeowner if you're looking to convert your system. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Gabby now, who will be discussing our workforce development program that will be rolling out both in Hawaii and Maui. Thanks, Graham. We are excited to announce our new Work for Water program, which offers a unique opportunity for workforce development. The, workforce pro the Work for Water program is a free entry-level educational course aimed at inspiring individuals to join the wastewater industry and learn the skills and foundational knowledge needed to enter the workforce. Our goal, um, our program is designed to equip participants with the foundational knowledge to enter the wastewater industry. And this goal is uh, of the program is to address this critical technician workforce shortage that is required to replace the 83,000 cesspools with individual wastewater systems by 2050. Next slide, please, Sheila. This program is being funded by the Department of Labor and has partnered with the University of Hawaii, Hawaii Community College in Hilo, and the University of Hawaii Maui College. Next slide, please. The Work for Water program is an entry-level wastewater education curriculum. It is a six-week course with 18 hours of total class time. As you can see from the two priority maps here, we chose Maui and Hawaii Island because they are the highest priority and includes 74% of the cesspools within the entire state. We recognize that they have the largest number of cesspools needed to be converted to new systems. And as a result, they will have the largest amount of capacity needs relating to the workforce as the 2050 deadline approaches. Therefore, we will focus our efforts on these areas in developing the workforce. Next slide, please. Our timeline. There will be three separate cohorts of learning, both on Maui and on Hawaii Island, specifically at the Hilo Community College campus. The first cohort will start in September of 2023 and will end by 2024. Cohort two will take place in the spring of 2024 and cohort three will take place in the fall of 2024. Our program offers a comprehensive curriculum led by local and national wastewater and water quality professionals focusing on issues related to water in Hawaii, including the design principles behind various types of on-site wastewater systems. Other topics you can see here include water quality issues in Hawaii, the importance of wastewater management and treatment, design principles of on-site and individual wastewater treatment systems, operation and maintenance of on-site systems and individual wastewater systems, Hawaii wastewater regulations and policies, emerging trends and technologies in the wastewater industry, and wastewater industry job preparedness. There are many benefits of the Work for Water program. The program will equip participants with the foundational knowledge and skills needed to enter the wastewater industry workforce. Another one of the many benefits of participating in our Work for Water program 
is the opportunity to network and connect with potential employers. At the end of each of the Work for Water cohorts, students will participate in a VI organized networking event. During the event, participants will engage in a hoike, the Hawaiian concept that represents the sharing of knowledge. This event is designed to celebrate the participants' achievements in front of an authentic audience of potential employers and industry stakeholders. At the end of the course, each participant will also earn an industry recognized certificate of completion and a $500 stipend. One of the most important benefits is the positive community impact made by protecting Hawaii's natural resources. By participating in this program, participants will take the first step in pursuing a career in the wastewater industry. These positions offer competitive salaries and a stable and rewarding career path that offers excellent opportunities for growth and advancement. And with clean water and wastewater management services on the rise, there is no better time to join this industry. Here are a few potential career opportunities available, including wastewater engineer, wastewater treatment operator, water quality specialist, and many more in high demand. Before we move on to our Q&A session, where we will ask you to type questions in the chat, um, we would like to take one last brief poll. All questions will be multiple choice again, so please select the answer that best represents you. Similar to the pre-poll questions at the beginning of this meeting, there will be three multiple choice questions where you will ask, well, we will ask you to rank how much you disagree or agree with each of the statements on a scale of strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree or disagree, agree, and strongly agree. The three questions we will ask you to rank on their preference is, my awareness of environmental and human health issues related to wastewater and cesspools has increased after attending this meeting. The second statement, my awareness about relevant cesspool related government mandates has increased after attending this meeting. And the third statement, my awareness about wastewater related job opportunities has increased after attending this meeting. Then we will have finally one last question to gauge your interest in the Work for Water program that I just shared with you. If you or someone you may know are interested, please select one of the multiple choice questions. And there is an option for a fill in the blank where you can share and provide us with your best contact information. It can be an email or a phone number so that we can share more information with you about the Work for Water program after the meeting. Please remember to scroll down to see all of the questions. If you're on an iPhone or tablet or other device, you may need to rotate to be horizontal or lengthwise. If you have any questions or setbacks, please let us know in the chat. And remember to return to the poll by selecting the dot, 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 more button. We'll wait and give everybody a minute to respond. And thank you all for jumping in and answering these questions. It's really helpful to us to kind of get your feedback about these um, different questions. And for those who've already um, finished, you can think about if you have any questions um, that you'd like um, answered, we can you can put them in the chat um, or we can um, uh, you can unmute, uh, raise your hand that feature at the bottom of the screen um, under reactions and we can call on you on un unmute you, but probably the fastest and most efficient is just to, to put it in the chat. Um, but for those who might have trouble doing that or on their phones or something, um, just raise your hand. Um, and I've been trying to get to questions in the chat as we go, but if I missed you, I'm sorry, because there's a lot coming in. So um, yeah, so if your question got missed, just make sure to raise your hand um, first off, and we'll make sure to get to that question. Yeah, or if, uh, um, thanks for answering those questions as we went along, Christina, and if you want to repeat the question, or if you have a variation of it, um, just feel free to put it in the chat now. Um, and we'll give this, a, you know, probably 20 more seconds. We've got about 60 people um, who've responded so far. Um, I'd love to see if we can get it to 65 or 70. 
again, like a telethon, <laughs> thank you for your participation. And we're almost at 65. Come on, people. <laughs> the image that we are displaying right now, you can scan the QR codes if you are interested in learning more about our Work for Water program. And just to echo, um, Stuart, I just wanted to mahalo nui loa for your time and your patience and participation tonight. Um, we're looking forward to answering your questions in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll start the, the Q&A portion of this. And uh, as Gabby mentioned, you can just um, hold your phone up on camera um, and uh, you can um, do a screen, um, view it, and you'll, a link should appear. Um, uh, with the QR code, so we can um, you can get more information, but also just feel free to email us at info at vicleanwater.org. And um, how do we want to do this, Christina? Do you want to um, do you want to call people uh, with their questions and help us, or should we? How do you want to do that? I can read some of the questions that are coming out um, in the chat right now. Um, so if that works for everyone, um, let's see one, one quick one that I can answer just really quickly. Do we have to convert our cesspool? Um, yes, every cesspool currently with the current legislation has to be converted by 2050. Um, and then just going from the top, um, there's a question about is rising ocean level likely to affect the Ali'i Drive sewer? when and how? Uh, that's a good question because it's true that as rising sea levels uh, affect the islands, there's going to be more seawater that interacts with wastewater infrastructure, and that includes cesspools, septic systems, and uh, sewer infrastructure. So when ocean water gets into, um, it can infiltrate into sewage infrastructure and then also exfiltrate, bringing pollution with it. Um, I can drop a link in the chat that shows as the University of Hawaii um, sea level rise viewer, so you can zoom in on your area of interest and look at the different scenarios for uh, for various types of or various um, projections of sea level rise. I'll drop that in. Thank you. And as a general answer, yes, sea level rise. We're already seeing um, certain areas that are near the coast where um, they're being inundated. Um, especially during extreme storm events. And so you can imagine just all that sewage when there's flooding is going right out into our waters, um, which is kind of like, you know, the, the sewage spills that we have um, at the Hilo wastewater treatment plant um, on occasion, uh, but not nearly the, the quantity. And if you want someone in particular to answer um, your question, feel free. And I see that um, John has his hand up, um, so maybe we can um, call on John um, to mix it up a little bit. Hi, I'm sorry. I started looking at all the questions, and um, I just was curious about the biochar system. Can, is there a way to do that individually or uh, the community would need to come together to do that? Yeah, that's a good question, John. Um, generally, um, community would need to come together um, to do that for a package plant. Um, and so, you know, you can, there are people, there was a company on the big island that was doing just local biochar in their backyard that were pre, people were bringing waste to, not, you know, uh, domestic waste, but more like branches and um, green waste and ag waste, and they were producing biochar and giving it to selling it to farmers who said they got much higher yields. Um, and so, but I don't think I think that company during the pandemic they um, they went back to the mainland, unfortunately. It does is there a plan for Hulua Loa or, or Kona from the state to? To, or, or is it up to individual homeowners to try to figure out something? Stuart, do you know the status of the um, Hawaii County wastewater plan? I don't. Maybe we can um, uh, bring in um, 
uh, Representative Lowen, do you know what the plans are? Because I am not exactly sure what the. Um, um, yeah, say the question is. Someone asked, "Is there a specific plan for Halualoa?" There's no, there's no specific plans at the state level for any particular area in terms of bringing. Uh, maybe let me backtrack because. Uh, there was a lot of talk about state legislation and, you know, I was pushing hard for those bills. I would have liked to pass stuff, but, um, you know, at the same time, we need the county to be working on things. And so if you're talking about plans for specific areas, um, that would really be, you know, if this county was going to look at there's higher density in a certain area or particular risk, like along Ali'i Drive where it's so coastal or in Hilo where there's higher density and there really should be sewer system. I mean, the county should be doing a state uh, countywide planning effort, and I think they actually are, um, to determine which areas should be sewered, um, and then they should move forward on doing that. Sewer and wastewater infrastructure is a county responsibility. Like, let's remember that when we have these discussions. Um, the state stepped in and put, uh, you know, we actually had legislation to um, prohibit the construction of new cesspools that the, you know, back in like 2016, maybe that was being opposed by the counties and then uh, didn't pass, but eventually the um, that was done by rule and then just enacted on the executive level by the governor. So, I mean, it's a problem that has been created, you know, by both the actions at state and county and the counties need to be um, doing their part and trying to address it. I think they are now, um, but they could be doing a lot more. But there are not specific plans for specific areas that would come from the state. I mean, the state might do like a, a pilot project for new technology. I mean, we don't have anything specific I can point to right now, but our programs like the grant programs um, and the when we had the tax credit, which expired were more geared towards criteria, like how close is it to the coastline? How close is it to drinking water? But it would still be first come first serve on a statewide level and not just for a certain area. Thank you so much, um, Representative Lowen. And, and then uh, one question um, that Barbara Wal Welsh uh, asked, and this might be for either uh, Rip Lowen or um, Councilmember Villegas, why is this a homeowner problem versus a county state issue? These homes were approved at construction. Anyone who want to take a, a shot at that? I'll I'll start, and if maybe um, someone could could follow up, the it's um it's a little complicated in that the the state wastewater branch in the Department of Health. Um, has to approve all systems and they have oversight. Um, but the counties are the ones that are in charge, as, as Rep Lowen said, of the, the sewer lines and, and, uh, and, and kind of overseeing um, different systems. And so um, where there was no um, kind of plan in place or sewer in place, um, it was just kind of development, to be honest, development happened so fast that they basically said, okay, do what you need to do. And they allowed cesspools. Hawaii was the last state to ban cesspools by three and a half decades. It is a substandard system. It is not accepted anywhere in the United States anymore. It should not have been allowed to go on for so long. And that's kind of what Rebecca Villegas mentioned earlier. It is, it's like fouling your nest. You're polluting um, the, the groundwater and drinking water wells. And just to bring it home, how important this is, this is not just, you know, something that academics are talking about. In Hawaii Paradise Park, they sampled um, 25 drinking water wells and 23 of them had fecal, in, I mean, excuse me, 50% of those wells had fecal indicator bacteria in them. Um, so there was contamination of their drinking water. So this is a very serious issue that's only going to get worse. And then when you talk about the reefs, these are what protect the island from storm events. And, you know, we, wastewater is kind of the final straw. There are so many stressors on the reefs already, and we've had coral bleaching events. 
And scientists are saying, if you continue to add nitrogen from the wastewater, that really could be um, you know, the final straw for these reefs and, and collapse. And then you know, there, it, it goes from there. There are kind of a lot of um, kind of, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm losing the words, but you know, it's a cascading effects from, from that alone. And thank you all for answering questions in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. George, is it okay if I just chime in a little bit? Please, please jump in. Um, you know, Nicole is right. It is our responsibility in the county of Hawaii to figure out some solutions and then look to the state for support. But until we have a plan, I want to give a shout out to Ramzi Mansour, who is our current director of the Department of Environmental Management. I still um, think calling that department environmental man management is odd when it's really solid and liquid waste, <laughs> wastewater and solid waste management. So um, let's make it sexy and call it environmental management. But um, Thank you to Ramsey for uh, taking this job and being willing to endure uh, all of the uh, questions and responsibilities. Something that I find um, ironic but telling and also an opportunity for us all to transition the way we think about this is it's easy to say the county or the state. There is no the county and there is no the state. There are the people who are working in the positions and serving in the roles that they're serving in at the time. What we are currently having to deal with are the repercussions of the decisions that were made by people in positions of leadership, power, authority, uh, development, whatever not, from decades ago. And all you have to do is watch the news for 30 seconds and you can see places around the world the country and the state who are currently navigating the consequences of some poor choices and decisions made on value systems that I like to think are no longer in alignment with the things we value now. Um, but we have to literally um, look at the crap we've created and recognize the value systems that dictated those choices, which allowed for um, Things like cesspools could just be continually utilized as a means for disposal of our waste without looking at the long-term consequences. So we are where we are. My district's at capacity until we make these opportunities for solutions available. The county has to take responsibility for these things. It's going to take political will it's going to take, for lack of a better word, I want to say cojones, but I kind of like, like the uterus is stronger. So in my own weird feminist um, analogies to stand up for, to some of the decisions that are in the way of making more bold choices. And they include things like the Kono decision and challenges and concerns about the unions and jobs and whatnot. So they are philosophical, they are environmental, and then there are just those that are um, logistics about how we can move forward in recreating a paradigm that allows for us to enact these bold options when it comes to operating in the system of our current local government, which can oftentimes feel like you're being asked to do a job, but your hands are tied. So I just humbly offer that as my mana'o for um, some of the challenges we face, which is why this collaborative effort between government, nonprofit, and private enterprise is where we need to get to this, um, this point of uh, fruition and decision making and then action. And it's going to take bold and courageous moves. And, and it's going to take input from everyone because government doesn't have what it takes to solve all these issues because they weren't all created by government. A lot of them were created by private enterprise that intention was profit margins to begin with. So we, we all get 
to, we all have the opportunity, the responsibility, and um, the kuleana to participate. And that's why evenings like this evening, as challenging as they can be, are also really heartening that so many people are willing to be involved in this conversation. Thank you. I appreciate that, Rebecca. All right, well, we have um, a few more minutes here um, and uh, want to get some more questions. Christina, do you wanna um, handle the next question? Sure, yeah, I have been frantically typing. So um, <laughs> um, there's a few questions as kind of a theme that we could discuss about what happens if you know, we're near a sewer line, but like, how do we connect to a sewer line? Um, is it even a good idea to connect to a sewer line when there's lots of um, improvements that need to happen to the municipal wastewater treatment plants? Um, so if we wanna to speak to those kind of topics, it would be great. Sorry, could you hear me? My um, my screen froze for a second there. No, yeah, we could hear you. So uh, okay, good. Yeah. Um, I think uh, yeah. Ram is is on. Oh, you unmuted him. Okay. Yeah, thank you. First, I want to mahalo everyone and thank Councilmember Viagas and Rip Nicole Lowens for for their comments. Uh, it's it definitely takes a teamwork. Um, we we got bad deal to start with and i think we're gonna fix it if the teamwork continues between the private vi is a great nonprofit um organization scott you're doing a great job um and definitely that need to continue um it is we need to strengthen the relation because it's there's no state and county i think it's it's all our koleana to to work together and get it right um and to me i look at it as two folds one is to stop the bleeding and fix what we got and don't allow the opportunity the second fold is make sure that we strengthen our state codes and county codes um to avoid falling into the same predicaments that we felt in when we start approving cesspools septic tanks is going to be the next thing to be abandoned down the road eventually um but i understand our challenges uh so we need to to be ahead of the game and we need to plan smarter of how to set our community for success and environmental protection moving forward. As far as the county, we have done a lot and I think uh, we are working on creating what we call as, um, you know, uh, the integrated waste manage management plan that just pertaining to the wastewater, usually EPA has certain criteria to meet the integrated waste management plan they have six element you have to, to meet as a template. And that include the stormwater, but unfortunately, um, you know, we dealing, like Rebecca said, as uh, we deal with wastewater and solid waste, uh, the stormwater falls totally under different department and, and different criteria and what have you. But uh, to me, the, Stormwater is the big elephant in the room as well. Uh, just when we had the flash flooding just uh, just last weekend. And you could have seen that brown water making it straight to the Kailua Bay. I mean, I saw it flowing down the major drainage channel. And Sunday I went for my walk and you could see the whole front it's brown as the same water I saw it upstream. Okay. So definitely we have a lot of work ahead of us, not only in the wastewater, but also 
in the stormwater system if we want to protect our shoreline. So that that's for sure. Um, but yeah, we've taken major steps um, in um, trying to create master plans to allow for solution to our constituents within the county. So the intent and the plan is eventually any of our constituents could log into our website, insert their parcel number and the details, options of what's, you know, what's the possible conversion for them based on their location. As we do these master plan also to figure out how we're gonna bring the sewer line um, into their front yards and creating sewer districts without getting into um, you know, certain laws that already exist um, and maintain it either within the public or private. But there's yeah. a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that the private become part of the solution. And we need find ways from legislative um, ways or either at state or county level to start bringing the private in because they do bring a lot of knowledge and and capital as well. And some of the areas in the county, as you all know, it's decentralized, um, but certain areas we have great private companies that could provide the service as well. Yeah. So we need to think outside the box and get you guys all involved. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things on that note that um, I just think it's very important just to remember that, you know, as a cautionary tale, the only place that has more cesspools than Hawaii is Suffolk County, New York, um, in Long Island. And they have more volume. We have the most per capita. And they have harmful algal blooms. And it can shut down an entire area. And just because of the nitrogen pollution and their fishing industry, and I used to go there, the shellfish industry when I was a kid is completely collapsed. And you can't eat shellfish from that area anymore without taking a really big risk. So the industry is collapsed. So these are very real world, they have hard economic uh, repercussions. And so I think it's just important to remember that we are in this together. We're one nonprofit that's trying to help and trying to bring the state and the counties together with homeowners and find solutions. So there's no one silver bullet. We like to say there are many arrows in our quiver. And you know we just ask that you work with us, work with your counties and your state representatives to help us you know, and help you find solutions. Um, because there is a lot of federal money available. Right now, it's up to the homeowner to do this. But we have to work together and find ways to get that money to Hawaii. Um, and so in respect for our time, just because we are past eight o'clock, I wanna wrap it up right now. I really wanna thank um, Representative Lowen for joining us and for council member Rebecca Villegas for joining us, to Ramzi Mansour, to our panelists, um, wow. Stephen, Col Stephen Colbert, which is very, I love your name, Stephen, because I grew up with Steve, uh, Stephen Colbert of The Late Show. And so I always say, oh, Stephen's on this show. Um, the Late Show is watching. Um, and thanks for your work with Tracy Wigner doing the research that shows how serious these issues are for water quality. Um, and I really want to thank all of you for joining. There's so many familiar names um, on this uh, list tonight, people who are working in their communities on this issue. So we mahalo you and really appreciate all the work. And we will continue this discussion. And uh, we want to want you to know that we are a nonprofit ally that is, is here to help you. And we will be emailing you, sending you slides and a recording. Um, so let's stay in touch. And we want to thank you again for joining us. And thank you to my vice staff who are just amazing. Um, you guys do such a good job. We appreciate the work. And if you're curious about, um, the Workforce for Water program, let us know about that as well. Mahalo.